Hey friends, Matt here. Welcome to Learn to Discern. In today's video, we are going to be assessing some more teaching of Tavner Smith, the senior pastor of Venue Church in Tennessee. We're going to be looking at three clips taken from a recent sermon that he preached. After each of those clips, we'll come back, we'll open up God's Word, and we will compare what he is saying to the Bible. But first, if you want to help promote Christian content on YouTube and get this out to more people here on the internet, please go ahead and take a second now to subscribe to my channel and thank you in advance. All right, I've described the format, so let's go ahead and jump into our first clip. I've been saying this for quite some time now, but the greatest tragedy that we could have is at the end of our life, find out that we were successful at the thing we weren't called to do. And how sad it would be if we spent our life learning and pushing and working and striving to become something less than what God actually intended us to become. And we dove into the story at the beginning of this season. It's kind of our key scripture that we come out of in 2 Kings where Elisha visited the lady who her husband had died and they're about to haul her kids off to, to do labor, to pay off all of her debts. And she's like, I just need help. And he says, what do you have? She says, I just have a little oil. He said, well, go borrow some jars from your neighbors and put them on the table. And what the Lord has been showing us is this is that the harvest, what we receive, what God does, is not about his ability to provide. Do you know what it's about? It's about our ability to contain. It's not about does God have the oil to pour in our life. It's do we have the jars on the table to receive it. Remember in the story, as long as there was a jar, the oil would pour. The Bible didn't say the oil ran out. It just said it stopped flowing. And as long as we keep putting these jars on the table, as long as we start opening these doors in our life for God to do something in us, I'm telling you something, hear me. He'll continue to pour out into you in such ways that it'll literally blow your mind. And you'll look back at your life a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, and you won't even recognize the person you needed to be, uh, that you used to be. Because you've put so many jars on the table and God's done so much in you that you will have almost like gotten on a rocket ship and been blasted into your destiny. Okay, guys, so let's break down that first clip. Tavner said, and I quote, What if we were successful at the thing we weren't called to do? What if we did all of this striving and we became something less than God actually intended us to become? Now, friends, there is a godly way to understand that statement, and there is an ungodly way to understand it. And I think the problem is that Tavner doesn't give any sort of clarity. And in fact, I think the way that he is talking, it leads people to make the ungodly conclusion. So the godly way to think about that would be to say, what if we spent our whole life striving after things that don't honor God, that aren't important to him, and we succeed in all these things when we could have been growing in Christ's likeness and doing things that matter more to God. So that is a correct way to understand it. Maybe you're chasing after things that don't have eternal value when you should be focusing on heavenly things and things that are eternal. However, the way that Tavner talks about it, I don't think that's the conclusion that many people are going to come to. Rather, when he says, what if we're successful at the things we weren't called to do? What if we were striving and we became something less than what God intended for us to be? I think he makes it sound like he's saying, you know, what if you got to this level in work and you could have been at this level? What if you could have done more? What if you could have done greater things, had greater purpose and greater accomplishments here on earth? So I think a lot of people, their takeaway is going to be, oh, I can make more money. Oh, I can advance further in work. I can accomplish all of these sorts of things in the here and now. And I think that places the emphasis on more temporal things. Now, again, does he say those specific words? No, but the way that you talk about it, I certainly think that leads people to make that conclusion. And I, I just want to read a couple of verses here from James chapter 3. This is uh, verses 14 and 15. It says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. So selfish ambition, wanting to accomplish great things in this life, that are not for the glory of God ultimately. And I want to be clear here, guys. I'm not saying that every person who listens to this message is going to come to that conclusion, but I think there are many that would, right? If that is your goal, how can I accomplish more things in the here and now so that I can advance myself, I can make more money, I can have more fun, whatever it may be. It says, 
that didn't come down from above. It says it's unspiritual and it's demonic. So I think when you talk about things in this sort of way, you are leading people to make those sorts of conclusions. And from that point, he went on to talk about the story of Elisha and the widow. And he said, you know, the, the big takeaway from that story is that there's no problem with God's ability to provide. It's all about our willingness, our ability to receive. And again, there's a partial truth in that. God certainly doesn't have a problem providing. God can do all things and can do them very easily. So certainly there's no problem in God being able to do something. But when you talk about things in this way, it makes it sound like you are saying that whatever great thing you wanted to accomplish, whatever you want to take place in your life, God has the provision for it. It's just your willingness to receive it. So basically, you want a miracle, you want a breakthrough, you want advancement, whatever it is, God's willing to provide it. You have to be willing to receive it. And friends, ultimately, this makes it all about us. It, it makes us sovereign because God wants to do it and can do it, but really you're the one who has ultimate control because are you going to put your jar out in faith to receive it? I want to read Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. And by the way, this is going to be a consistent theme in uh, Tavner's teaching today is that he doesn't seem to fully understand the sovereignty of God and that God does all that he wills and all that he pleases. So Proverbs 16, 9 says, the heart of man plans his way but the Lord establishes his steps. So you might have plans, you might have all sorts of thoughts about what is going to take place, but God's will will ultimately be done. All right, that's it for our first clip. Let's go ahead and jump into the second one. I just read you out of Acts chapter two. I don't know if you're familiar with the story. I don't ever take for granted who's in the audience or who's watching all over the world. I don't know if you've ever read your Bible, been in church before. Maybe this is your first time in the church world. We call this the day of Pentecost. Uh, we, we, we call this the time where, where Jesus has, has resurrected from the dead. He's, he's come and he's given his disciples a commission. You're going to go preach the word all over the world. You're going to win people to Jesus. It's still happening today, thousands of years later. But it, before he said that, he said, but before you go, you've got to wait for a second. Because after I go, I'm going to send someone special into your life. The, the reason I have been able to do the miracles I've done, the reason you've seen what you've seen is because I have been filled with the power and the presence of another part of who I am called the Holy Spirit. And if you will wait, and if you'll receive this Holy Spirit, and if you'll welcome this Holy Spirit, and if you'll give this Holy Spirit permission to live out in fullness in your life, you will be able to do everything I've commissioned you to go do and so I have one big theological problem with that last clip, but I want to start with two things that just sort of rub me the wrong way. Uh, number one is when Tavner Smith was saying, you know, the reason that I have been able to do all of my miracles just kind of rubs me the wrong way because it seems like you're putting a lot of the focus on yourself. Look how great I am because I can do the miracles. And, and friends, I understand he, he is talking about the Holy Spirit. So I don't think he was saying that he was doing the miracles in his own power, but it still just kind of rubs me the wrong way uh, when you speak that sort of way. And then number two was when he said, the Holy Spirit is another part of who I am. I think that's very sloppy language because it makes it sound like you and God are one, like ontologically, like there is no distinction and no difference between you and God. And again, I'm not saying that's what he is teaching. I just think it's sloppy language. So I think he needs to clean some of that up. But listen, if you disagree with me that I'm not throwing my hat into the ring and saying, oh my goodness, this is heretical in every sort of way. No, I want to have some grace, but it did kind of rub me the wrong way. But here's where I can say, theologically, he is way off base. So right after that, he said, if you will give this Holy Spirit permission. Okay, friends, where in the Bible do you see any sort of verse, any passage that talks about giving God, giving the Holy Spirit permission? It's not in there. And in fact, I say it's a really big problem to say that you need to give the Holy Spirit permission because the Holy Spirit is God. Think about just giving permission in general. I've used this uh, example before. Do you give permission to your boss so that your boss can take vacation? No. Why? Because your boss is in the position of authority. Your boss gives you permission. You don't give your boss permission. The same thing would happen between parents and children. Do the children give parents permission to do things? No, because the parents are in position of authority. The parents give the children permission to do things. So when you say you need to give the Holy Spirit permission, it sounds like what you were saying is 
you are in the position of authority over the Holy Spirit. I mean, again, is Tavener using those words? No, friends, but that is what it sounds like, that the Holy Spirit can't do anything unless you allow him to do these things, right? You ultimately have authority, and you need to give the Holy Spirit permission. Once again, Tavener does not seem to understand the sovereignty of God. So let's look at two passages. This is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. It says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So God works all things according to the counsel of his will. His will is going to be accomplished. He does not need your permission to do anything. Now, let's look at Psalm 135 and verse 6. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. Whatever God pleases, he does. It doesn't say whatever God pleases, he does as long as you give him permission. Nope. Whatever he pleases, he is going to do. And so Tavner Smith is flip-flopping the roles here without saying as many words. He makes it seem like you are sovereign over God. Big problem. All right, one more clip we have to get to. Let's go ahead and check it out. The Bible talks about, and you can go there and read it yourself, Hebrews chapter 6. It talks about how as we, it just says this, it says we're going to get past the elementary things of the doctrine. In that it includes the doctrine of baptisms. Multiple with an S. There's three baptisms. There's, there's the baptism into the body of Christ. That's salvation. There's the baptism in water. That's when someone actually baptized you and it's a representation of what God does and breaks strongholds on your life. And then there's a third baptism. It's the baptism in the Holy Ghost. It's not that you don't get all of the Holy Ghost when you get saved. When you get saved, all of the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get comes and lives in you. It's not do you get all of him, it's this, does he get all of you? Yeah. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, when, if you've heard that term before, the third baptism, is not about can you come into me more. It's all of you that is in me, I release to do anything it wants to do. Now, Because here's what we got to understand about the Holy Spirit. You heard me say this before, maybe you didn't know what it means. But the Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman. We're not robots, and he's not going to force us to do anything. He is going to enter and become a part of your life at the level you invite him. Okay, so before we tackle the sovereignty issue, once again, let's start with Tavner's statement that there are three baptisms. And he said that we can check him out on that by looking at Hebrews chapter 6. So that's exactly what we'll do, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So to be fair, at the beginning of verse 2, it says instruction about washings. Some translations will have that as baptisms. But if you study this passage and what the author of Hebrews is really getting at, he is really saying, listen, we need to understand the difference between Old Testament baptism and purification rites and washings and New Testament baptism. That's why it says baptisms in some uh, translations because it's talking about the old way of doing it and baptism in the New Covenant. It is not saying that there are multiple types of baptism. And uh, we know that definitively because I am just shocked that he wouldn't understand this. This is Ephesians chapter 4. So if you're like, I don't know, Matt, seems pretty clear there's multiple Let's look at Ephesians 4, verses 4 and 5. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is one baptism. So when he says, oh, there's three, friends, I mean, Scripture could not be more clear. There is one. So he obviously is mishandling that passage of scripture to teach something that is not biblical. But now let's get back to the sovereignty issue once again. So Tavener said, all of you that is within me, I release to do anything it wants to do. Uh, first of all, we need to tackle this sloppy language. Now, he has been referring to the Holy Spirit as a person, and he has been saying he, his, him, those sorts of things. And that's good because the Holy Spirit is a person. But now he says, I release to do anything it wants to do. So I don't believe that he thinks that the Holy Spirit is a force, but that's kind of sloppy language, probably something that we need to clean up. But I can have grace. We all make mistakes, but, you know, that is sloppy. But all of you that is within me, I release to do anything it wants to do. So who's sovereign there? Tavner Smith. Tavner Smith saying, I release you. 
<laughs> you know, Holy Spirit, don't worry. You have my permission to go do everything. No understanding of the sovereignty of God. And then he said towards the end, the Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman. He isn't going to force us to do anything. Friends, I know that's a really common saying in Christianity, but can you find a passage of scripture that will back up and support the fact that the Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman? What do you mean by that? I also think it's just not helpful to say things like that when, like, what do you mean he's a perfect gentleman? He opens the car door for you? I mean, I, you know, what is that even supposed to mean? But Tavner seems to be insinuating that the Holy Spirit's not going to do anything in your life unless you give him permission, unless you allow him to do so. Well, again, let's look at two more passages of scripture. The first one is in Isaiah chapter 45. This is verses three through six. This is talking about Cyrus. Cyrus is a pagan king. He was not a follower of God. He was not a believer in any sort of way, yet God chose to use him to free his people. So let's, let's look at this passage. This is God speaking to Cyrus. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. So did you notice a couple of times that God is speaking to Cyrus? He says, you don't know me. You don't claim me. You don't follow me. You're, you're not one of my people. I'm going to use you anyways. So this whole idea, God needs permission. God comes to Cyrus and says, you don't know me. You're not even a believer. You don't even have faith in me. I'm going to use you anyways. God does not need permission. Last one. This is Proverbs 21 and verse 1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. God is sovereign and God will do whatever he wishes. Now, again, friends, I understand there's helpful ways to certain uh, think about certain things in terms of, um, you know, some people will talk about partnering together with the Holy Spirit. Certainly, we need to have faith. We need to believe that God can do certain things. Prayer is important, all of those sorts of things. So I'm not saying that we don't pray or we don't do other things because God is sovereign and that means we sit back and do nothing. No, that would be going in error on the other side, but it is really dangerous when you make it seem like you are sovereign over God and that he needs your permission and he can't do anything unless you allow him to do so. That is a massive problem. I think we have seen from today and from some of Tavner's teaching in the past that he does not rightly handle God's word. I also point out, um, Listen, I'm not into Christian gossip business, but I think it is important when we talk about a Christian pastor. Tavner Smith has had some pretty significant moral failings um, that are out there that he has admitted to, and yet he has restored himself to ministry, although it is, it's pretty clear that he does not meet the qualifications of being an elder. I mean, one of them is that you have to rightly handle God's word. He doesn't do that, but that you must be above reproach. And uh, Tavner Smith is an adulterer. He has committed adultery. He was caught <laughs> um, in the act, so to speak, uh, where he was caught with another woman and they were wearing towels in the house. Like, I mean, it was pretty obvious what was taking place there. So um, he is not qualified to be in ministry in the first place. I do pray for Tabner Smith. I want him to come to an understanding of God's word. I want him to, um, you know, if he's not a believer and friends, I don't know if he's not a believer, I want him to know God and I want him to grow in his understanding of that. But certainly right now he is not qualified to be in the position of an elder of a pastor. So definitely you should not be listening uh, to his teaching. Plus he doesn't know how to handle God's word. So I hope this is helpful in your understanding of God's word, of God's sovereignty, that he is in control of all things that you'll stop quote, giving God permission. He, he doesn't need it, that you will humbly ask him for things. Understanding he has all power, you humbly ask him. Put yourself in the right position there, friends. All right. Again, I hope this is helpful. If it is, if you would please take a second to subscribe to my channel, I greatly appreciate it. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, God bless.